So my name is Blake Dinius. That's me. Prior to this job, I worked in research, primarily with honeybees and other insects, such as springtails. This is an image of grafting honeybee larvae out of a hive and putting it into these well plates where we would rear them until adulthood. In my current role, I deliver a bunch of education in the form of workshops, walks. I might even go into libraries and give programs to kids. Um, so the age range doesn't really matter and, and the location is, is very variable as well. But you can think of me as just a giant bug nerd. I've been into bugs my entire life and I just really enjoy them. So we're gonna to talk today about invasive insects. So what makes something invasive? You hear this term used a lot um, and in, to be honest, it's really complicated. Um, some people will use this term to refer to a plant that's growing in their yard that it just seems to be growing uncontrollably. Um, that's not the, the scientific definition of invasive. Um, invasive means a specific thing and there's an actual science behind it. Uh, and it's a really deep, complicated topic. Uh, even the terminology surrounding what makes something invasive is very, is very uh, extensive. So you can have anything from invasive to you know, temporary, transient, adventive, uh, people in these these terms seem to mean different things than your typical uh, colloquial term. Uh, they just have specific definitions and there doesn't seem to be a consensus on uh, what is the appropriate terms to use from uh, within even the, the research community. So in general, invasive insects are just insects that are bad. Uh, that's kind of the way we want to talk about it. So, but how do you define bad? What does that mean? And a lot of times when we define bad, it comes from uh, our own perspective. So something might be bad if it impacts human beings, for instance, but if it impacts just uh, something floating out there in the environment, they may not consider that to be bad enough. So in general, uh, a bad insect would have a negative impact uh, on things around it, kind of like this evil villain right here. And it usually refers to ecological damage. Um, and this is typically very drastic, very extensive ecological damage. This image here is an image of a gypsy moth caterpillar. You can tell it's a gypsy moth based on the coloration. The, the best way to, that at least that I identify them, is you've got those blue spots in the front, and then you've got the red spots in the back. And you can kind of see that separation. But with gypsy moth, you know, we have extensive defoliation of trees and it even results in tree death. And so that's the important thing is that this is not just a couple trees that are dying, that this is very severe and very extensive. And then the, those trees that are dying are not just an eyesore and bad for us, they're gonna impact some things like native caterpillars. So a lot of times people might call these, these are um, the Eastern tent caterpillar. This is actually a native caterpillar that feeds on trees. Some people may uh, actually uh, kind of talk poorly about this particular caterpillar. They think that this is the, the, the gypsy moth, um, but it can be distinguished based on its appearance. And this is a native caterpillar that will feed on trees. It doesn't typically kill trees. Uh, it's just the, a normal native insect that exists around here. Um, and sometimes you can, you can see these native uh, tent caterpillars because there's a lot, you'll see a lot of webbing on trees. And that webbing, that's not gypsy moth, that's tent caterpillars. But these tent caterpillars are certainly going to go hungry if the gypsy moth caterpillars eat all the trees. Sometimes an invasive insect can be called invasive with respect to its impact on, on human health. Uh, so this is an Asian tiger mosquito. And this is something that is not necessarily uh, impacting the ecology around it negatively. It's, it's just impacting human beings. And so we might call that invasive just for that sake or impacts on agriculture. So this is an Asian longhorn tick. Uh, this was a tick that was introduced fairly recently. And this is something that, as far as we know, isn't impacting the ecology around, around us that, that severely. It might be displacing some other tick species. Um, and it, it's not something that we have noticed has transmitted human diseases but this can be an impact on, on livestock. And you can see all these ticks that are just on this. Um, I'm not sure what kind of mammal this is. Um, that mammals are not really my forte, but you can see all these 
ticks on just this ear of this animal. And so that can have some severe impacts on money, uh, on food and money. So the other important thing to note about invasive insects is that they must be exotic. So just because something is spreading really quickly in your area or it seems to be taking over, it does not necessarily mean, it actually doesn't mean invasive at all. So sometimes people will think of a deer or wild turkeys in our area as being invasive. They're not because they're native, even though they may be seemingly taking over the area. Um, so in the case of gypsy moth, for instance, gypsy moth came from Europe. And this was a, a moth that was actually brought over intentionally um, for silk production. They, they tried to bring it over to create silk in our country. Um, but it, in most of the time, invasive insects, they come from a different continent, but that's not necessarily the case. If you look at the United States, for instance, our East Coast is a vastly different from our West Coast. So if you were to take a, an insect from the West Coast and bring it over to the East Coast, that would, even though it's still within the same country and the same nation, on the same continent, that would still be considered invasive um, because insects and uh, other organisms, they don't really respect these uh, man-made boundaries. So you could even have something from just across the border in Mexico move up into Texas and that still might be considered invasive even though it's in the same area. And so deer ticks, I just have to bring up, these are pests, they're found everywhere, but because they're native, they would not be considered an invasive species. So I want you to just kind of wait one second. So not every exotic species that comes into this country is invasive. Um, and that's the other, the other catch. Some can actually be considered beneficial and some of people consider some, certain exotic species to just be adventive or uh, just kind of there, just kind of existing without a huge impact on everything around them. So, in one case of a beneficial insect, this is uh, a fly called Cyzenus albicans. This was a fly that was intentionally introduced into the country as biological control for winter moth. When, uh, when insects get introduced into the country, uh, a lot of times people will ask the question, does anything eat it? And more often than not, there are some things that will eat that insect, but sometimes it's just not in high enough quantities and sometimes it, it, sometimes it doesn't exist. And in the case of winter moth, we didn't have a very good predator for that particular moth. There were some things like ground beetles that would eat winter moth, but not in very high quantities. And so if you wanted to, if you wanted to control winter moth with something that was, was natural, was a natural control, you would have to introduce another, another exotic species. So this, this, uh, this fly, it doesn't come from this country. And, but it does a very good job at controlling winter moth and just winter moth. Honeybees are another really good example of something that is not native to this country, uh, not native to the continent even. This, these come from Europe. Um, we think that they were traced back to either Africa or Asia. And uh, we need honeybees. I mean, they're useful for tasty food like honey and pollinating our fruits. And then uh, horses. Horses are not native to our country either. Um, but horses are very, you know, people love horses. And uh, the, the thing with horses is that they were actually introduced after a, a lot of the native horses in America were already extinct. So they kind of filled in that niche around there. And not everything that is introduced into this country becomes invasive. Some of, most of the insects and most of the organisms that come into our country are assumed to just kind of poof out of existence. They come in they're not suited for this habitat. They don't have the right food maybe, they don't have the right climate. Uh, the conditions need to be just right for something to establish in this country. It's not very easy for that to happen. Um, so for example, in this particular study, the researchers estimated in four years, 2000 insect species were introduced into America. So that you can think of that as, as, that's a pretty extreme measure when people hear about, oh, gypsy moth or winter moth, now we have one more thing that's made into this country. How could that happen? But for the record, there are thousands of insects that get introduced into the country, but only a very limited number of them end up establishing. So in this particular study, they estimated that only 2% of those insects actually survived the establishment process out of the, the, the 2000. Um, it was approximately 2%. They estimated about 42 species from that. 
So there are several barriers that when, when an insect makes it into this country that they need to overcome. And with each of those barriers, there's the opportunity for that insect to, to die and, and, and they call it invasion failure, where it just doesn't, it doesn't survive. And so, you know, in terms of, I'm not gonna walk you through this completely, but in terms of, you know, you have transport coming into the country, the introduction, um, getting into this country, establishing, so being able to survive and reproduce, and then being able to spread. So all of these things could lead to potential ability for this insect to, uh, to just not make it, to just kind of go away on its own. So is, is the insect a good fit? Um, you know, it doesn't have the things it needs to survive, um, habitat, climate, food. This is an example, this insect on the left is called the spotted lanternfly. And this insect, it, we don't fully understand its life cycle yet, but there is some indication that this insect may need another plant called tree of heaven. So it feeds on a variety of different plants and we know this, but for some reason, it just really, really likes this plant. And tree of heaven is not a native plant to our country. We brought in tree of heaven because it's a very quick growing tree. It's a very industrious tree. People can use it to plant inside cities and give shade really, really quickly and easily. And so we imported Tree of Heaven into our country. And there is reason to believe that without Tree of Heaven, this insect, the spotted lanternfly, may not have been able to establish in our country. Um, we don't know for sure, but there, there is some good evidence that suggests that. Are there things that normally keep these populations in check? Are they lacking when that makes it into the country? So that's another important thing. So this is the uh, Asian giant hornet. Uh, this has been called the murder hornet in recent news headlines. Um, this particular hornet uh, will attack honey, will attack honeybees. And so in its native range, it attacks these uh, honeybees called Apis serrana. These are different than the honeybees we have in America. We have Apis mellifera. And within that native range, um, these, these honeybees have adapted to actually protect themselves against this hornet. And they do so by rolling up into a ball and vibrating their wings and vibrating their bodies and generating a lot of heat where it actually suffocates and uh, burns out this hornet. Our, our honeybees have not adapted that, that behavior and so they're, they're easy pickings for this murder hornet. Um, and so and this is a case where if this Asian giant hornet made it into this country, it could cause a lot of destruction because, simply because our bees are just not adapted. And this would have, this uh, hornet could, would kind of roam free without um, any, uh, any, uh, anything to keep it in check. The other thing that's really important about invasive insects is can it spread? You know, if, if an insect gets imported into the country and it stays very localized, it might not be considered invasive, um, but it could if the impact is very, very severe. Um, but in general, you're looking at an insect that can spread really easily. And so they can do so maybe by high reproduction. This is the Asian multicolored late, uh, the lady beetle. And so this beetle can reproduce in very large numbers and it has a very wide range with which it can disperse. And sometimes these insects can disperse either in wind or on birds or more often than not, they end up dispersing through people, through humans. That's how typically how they make it into the country anyways. In the past 150 years, there have been 2.5 insect species introduced each year. And I know I gave that prior um, estimate of 2000 in the span of those four years, um, but this, was, this, this particular study is looking at insects that actually are introduced and established in this country. Um, and so the, and that's an average. And you can see as you get closer to two, the year 2000, there are many, many more pests that get introduced versus prior into the, into the 1800s. Um, and we think that that might have to do with some things like detection methods. But the thing that tends to get blamed the most is globalization. So a lot more trade and a lot more travel tends to be the thing. Um, and then if you look at the red here, these are what we call high impact pests and pathogens. These might be things like your, um, like your gypsy moth or your winter moth. And on average, you might see one species every 2.3 years. So that's what you're kind of looking at. And so yeah, over the course of 150 years, there have been a lot of insects 
that have been introduced into this country. Um, and they estimate that this is the most serious ecological threat to the United States. So this is an example of a, a pine beetle that is causing some severe damage to the, the forest in this area. And you can see all of those dead trees in that particular area. And we estimate that 63% of the nation's forests are at risk simply because of the introdu introduction of invasive and in non-native insects. It costs a lot of money. Um, these, these introductions are costing a lot of money. So they estimate $25.2 billion just in the US are spent um, either controlling, managing, studying, um, or uh, preventing uh, invasive insects. Um, and then just these, these are things also, uh, you know, damage crops that's included in that total, you know, damaged lumber, uh, all of those things really add up. And we also estimate about 70 billion globally is spent on, um, on these costs. And then there are added healthcare costs like disease. So just for that Asian tiger mosquito, not specifically that species, but medically significant uh, invasive insects might be costing the US $2.6 billion. So a lot of money is being spent on uh, these invasive insects. To give some specifics, uh, diamondback moth, 4.6 billion per year, spruce longhorn beetle, 4.5 billion per year, the emerald ash borer, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, uh, in the a little, uh, very soon, 1.5 billion per year, gypsy moth, 25 million per year. So we think of gypsy moth as being pretty bad, especially in this area, but you look at some of these other insects and they're costing a lot more money. So emerald ash borer, what is it? Emerald ash borer, to be perfectly honest, if it wasn't invasive, is actually a very attractive beetle. Um, you can see it, it's part of a group, a family of beetles called jewel beetles, because they're very, they've got this iridescent sheen to them. And even the underneath the wings, you can see that nice purplish pink color. So it's got a, it's a very appealing looking beetle. It's very small. Um, this beetle is native to North, North China and Korea. We discovered it in 2002, uh, in, uh, I, I believe it was um, uh, Michigan, um, but it was, in the, it was in the upper Midwest. And we think it's been here since the 1990s. The larvae feed on the living tissue and trees. And you can see this larva, this beetle larva, it, it looks, it has almost like this kind of worm-like appearance. And it makes these S-shaped galleries right underneath the bark. And you can see how it in a tree, that's a lot of, that's the living tissue of the tree. So it really eats away at all the living tissue in that tree. And you can see in uh, Toledo, Ohio, you've got this, uh, this road and it was lined by these ash trees in 2006. And in just three years later, all of those ash trees were dead. So this emerald ash borer has a very, very drastic, very rapid impact on ash trees. The kind of saving grace with this emerald ash borer is that it really only attacks ash trees. So a lot of the other trees are pretty safe from it. But in southeastern Michigan, you can see that um, this emerald ash borer killed 5.6 million ash trees. And we really estimate that this, this pest is going to kill off 99% or more of all the ash that exists in this country. So it, it's, you're talking about a very drastic impact. Um, and you can see how, how far it's spread. Um, you can look at this upper Midwest area. Uh, and you can see all the little dots. And this was back in 2008. And then you can see what it looks like in 2019, where it's kind of just fanned out outward. And we've actually, we actually have it here in Massachusetts. So when you destroy that many ash trees, even though you're not killing all of them 100%, we do talk about things like a functional extirpation. So it's, it's almost as if the ash trees are extinct. So there's a lot of things that really depend on ash that simply just will not be able to survive uh, because, of all, because of how many ash trees have died out. Um, and so these can be different things. Like in particular, we've got 43 native animals, mostly insects that depend on ash. This is, a, is an example of the Eastern Hercules beetle. And this is a really, really cool beetle. It's, it's probably the largest beetle we have here in, in New England. Um, and it, it, this beetle, we, we assume, we don't actually know because it's not that well studied. We assume that this beetle is actually dependent on ash trees. And so because it, one of its uh, closely related beetles out west, um, 
Dynasties Granti is, is dependent on ash trees. And so we think that this one might be as well. And so it'd be really sad to see this giant beautiful beetle go just because it's, it's losing its native host. Um, and then we are also losing on things that impact our money. So like we're losing on a lot of hardwood, things that are used for bows, baseball bats, and guitars. Um, so it does have that human impact too. You know, if losing Dynasties to Tyus is not enough to kind of pull at your heartstrings, maybe it will uh, pull at your guitar strings. So how do, we, how do things get here? How do these insects get into this country? And can we just keep them out? You know, that seems like it would be a really simple solution. Why, not, why are we just letting these things in if they cost so much money and they're disrupting all of our ecosystems? Some insects, and this is, this is actually the rare instance, some are introduced on purpose. We talked about that fly, Cyzenus albicans, that was introduced into this country to control winter moth, and that was done intentionally. And then we also reviewed how gypsy moth was introduced for silk production. The multicolored Asian lady beetle that was introduced for aphid control. And, and, and a lot of people looking back at this lady beetle would admit that this was probably a mistake, introducing this lady beetle. And same thing with the gypsy moth. But nowadays, we're a lot smarter when we make these purposeful introductions, but they can still happen. And, and some people are also introducing insects into this country in the pet trade. That's something that really can't go um, unnoticed is, is how many people import things into this country just, just to have for fun. Um, and that's something that is, it should be very tightly controlled. But 95% of all insects introduced into this country are introduced by accident. Um, and they're done so through international trade and travel. And this is because inspection of insects and inspection and finding these isn't 100%. And you might think that this is uh, like, how could it not be? Like we're spending billions of dollars. Why can't we ramp up the regulations and hire more people? Um, we're gonna talk about how this might be easier said than done. So the emerald ash borer, that, that beetle that's responsible for destroying so many of our, uh, our ash trees, we believe that this might have arrived in crating in pallets and dunnage. So if you look at these how these, uh, this wood is imported into this country, you can see that if this beetle had tunneled into just one of these pallets, maybe on the inside, that that could easily be missed. And the dunnage, you, if you look on the bottom right, you can see that blue that, that I have circled right here. It's just spacing in between lumber. That, that, that beetle, if that beetle was inside one of those dunnage, th those, those things, that that might easily get missed. And how can you check all of that uh, in, in, in just like, how, how could that be, you know, it seems like very, very possible that maybe a beetle or two, a pregnant beetle or two might have gotten missed and somehow that, that just made it into this country and, and then it ended up establishing. So what can be done about this situation? So now we're at the point where it's how can, you know, how can, what, what are some things that you can go and do that can help prevent uh, maybe some of these invasive insects from causing as much damage as they are, as they are causing. Um, so the big thing is it's really, really important to not move firewood. And this is one of those heartbreaking moments where this emerald ash borer uh, might have actually been eradicated. They had a plan um, to actually eliminate emerald ash borer when it was in a very tightly quarantined area. And so it's natural movements. It doesn't fly, it doesn't tend to fly very far, less than 10 miles, and it kills ash ridiculously fast. And so the, the concept was that if you quarantine this beetle, that, this, that, that it, would, it would basically run out of food within three years. If you could keep that quarantine sustained for, th for, like, for a certain number of years, I, I don't wanna say three, just, a, just this X number of years, um, that it would immediately kill all that ash and, and then all of a sudden it would run out of food and then it would just blink out. It would be like one of those instances where this emerald ash borer wouldn't be the problem it is now. And then here at the bottom, this thing called alley effect. This is basically the concept when the populations are low, that there's certain fluctuations and random chance and, and they call it chaos, that basically uh, kind of prevent that insect from kind of going further. It, it basically would just naturally kind of die out. And so this is kind of the idea, but when it came to emerald ash borer, we think is that one of the major reasons why it wasn't eradicated 
was the fact that people were moving wood, um, in particular firewood. So they were taking firewood where emerald ash borer had, had basically developed inside, and you can see this image here, loaded it up, drove it somewhere outside that area, maybe they went camping somewhere else, or, or maybe, and then that emerald ash borer was able to establish outside in a different area. Um, some other things that can influence a successful eradication, um, and this was a study that was conducted, and, and some of these things are not necessarily um, pertinent to, the, to a homeowner, but they, these researchers found that if the area of infestation was small, it was typically easier to eradicate than insect. And that, that makes, logically, that makes sense. Um, you might be surprised at what people, what the questions people ask in research. Um, they found that, they also found that better detection tools were really, were one of the really, really important things in influencing eradication, knowing if something was there. So very often something can be in an area at very low levels, but if your trap isn't sensitive enough to detect that, then you might not, then it might be, might exist and you might assume that it doesn't exist. Or if you've tried to kill it, if you've tried to eradicate it and you just can't detect it, you might assume that your, your efforts to eradicate it were successful when really it's just going to bounce back later. They also found that more specific controls uh, were somehow uh, better at influencing eradication. So this is a gypsy moth caterpillar that has died from a, a fungus called Entomophaga myomega. So this is a non-native fungus that would just kind of naturally kill off gypsy moth. And they, they find, people find that when the control is very specific, uh, the, the general public doesn't mind when that control is implemented. If people were to, for instance, use a very general control, like spray an area with a, a very toxic pesticide, they find that the public is in general uh, very um, against that, or if they were going to cut down, say, a lot of trees in an effort to try to, to basically get rid of that pest. Again, people are kind of a little bit more hesitant to accept that. Um, and then the fourth reason, which, which does apply to you, is that they also found, and this is among kind of the four top reasons, is that citizen scientists, people um, just going out and finding these pests and reporting them, was one of the most successful ways of finding these pests. They found that when, uh, when scientists, when researchers or, or people working in forestry would actively go out and look for these pests, that was less successful than just relying on the general public to help them with this task. So it's really important that people like you listening are going out and looking for these and then reporting them in. So uh, just to give some examples, uh, half of all new plant pest detections in Australia were, were from citizen science, just people reporting them in. And then we also believe that every known Asian longhorn beetle infestation in the USA was detected by, by the general public. So even though we had people looking for Asian longhorn beetle, it's thought that all of the known, infest, where, the, where new infestation cropped up was done so from a, pers from a citizen scientist. So if you're going to report these insects, um, it's really important that you take good photos. Sometimes I occasionally get photos sent to me like the one on the left, and that can be almost impossible uh, to identify. So, and it, so it's good to get multiple angles, and don't be afraid to get really up close when you're taking this picture. Um, some, sometimes identification can really hinge on uh, maybe the shape of its legs, or how many hairs it has on its body, or a certain dot that it might have on its back. Uh, and so that can be really important is getting those details. If possible, it's, it's better to collect a specimen. And if this is something that you're having trouble with, maybe you're afraid of it, um, you can always call me, I'll come out and help. If, if you've seen something and you, you get a picture, you can send it to me, I'll go out and I'll go collect that specimen. I actually had a, a gentleman call me earlier this week uh, who had been dealing with some pests, some 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 possibly invasive beetles. He had he he didn't know what they were, so he gave me a call. I went out and I collected them, and I um I took some really good shots of those, and I have those sent into the state for further investigation. So you can always use me as a resource, and I'm happy to help. When you want to report these pests, it's important to report them to the state. So you want to go to this web address. You can just type in Massachusetts pest reports into Google and that should bring you to the correct link. Um, so now it's time for me to teach you about some of the 
really important insects that you should be on the lookout for today. So the emerald ash borer is really important. This is a really, we, we talked about this earlier, it's a really small beetle. And you can see it makes these, you know, in addition to kind of tunneling under that bark and making those S-shaped galleries, you can see this D-shaped hole that it actually uses, it actually tunnels out of. Emerald ash borer is heat not only here in Massachusetts, it's here in Plymouth County. And you can see we had our first detection in 2019. Um, so it's really important that you watch your ash. Um, so in that, in that kind of, on that kind of note, um, it's good to recognize what an ash tree looks like. So if you look at ash, it's got this gray bark. It has these like very um, kind of long grooves long vertical grooves you can see in this bark on the photo to the left. And if you look up, if you look at the branches, um, there are very few trees that have their branches that are uh, opposite to each other, that are kind of, you have one branch on one side and, one, and then another branch immediately coming off on the other side. So you, they usually alternate where you have one and then you might have another one uh, like kind of a little bit further up. If I can uh, find a tool to kind of draw with, um, I guess this, uh, this uh, webinar feature doesn't, doesn't allow that, but um, you can see where it has the, basically the star patterns. The, the, you can see how those branches are arranged. And that's really important for identifying ash trees. And then you can see the leaves below. The, the leaves are kind of, they, they're kind of shaped like that. They've, it's one leaf with a lot of little leaflets uh, attached. And, so, and when I was a kid, I used to think they were individual leaves. Um, but you can see each one of these photos is a full leaf with, with individual leaflets. So this is the way you would identify ash trees. And so because we know emerald ash borer only goes to, for ash, um, that's one way that you can find this pest. The other things you can look for are the very tiny D-shaped holes. That's really, really hard to see. Some of the other things are much more obvious. Uh, this photo on the bottom left, they call it epicormic sprouting. This is when you have uh, the tree basically growing fresh leaves at the base of its trunk. And so you can see that maybe the top of this tree is dying out where the emerald ash borer has burrowed in and, and basically destroyed all that living tissue at the top of the tree. The tree is now trying to send out additional leaves to try to survive. Um, this, they call it blonding bark, where you can see the bark has been kind of ripped away to reveal the under, underneath that, underneath that gray area. And this is you typically done usually by things like woodpeckers that are trying to dig at the, the beetle. And so kind of on that note, the emerald ash borer, it does have uh, a lot of things that eat it. So there are a lot of, there are, there's even a wasp that, that specifically goes after jewel beetles and, and woodpeckers will eat the, the larva too. Uh, one of the reasons why, and this is kind of a tangent, one of the reasons why we think that emerald ash borer had such an easy time establishing why it's so deadly to our ash trees has more to do with the fact that in its native range, the ash trees uh, in Asia have natural defenses that kind of prevent this emerald ash borer from attacking healthy trees. Here in America, this emerald ash borer is attacking trees and our trees don't have those defenses to kind of keep this emerald ash borer from killing healthy trees. Um, over in its native range, it tends to only attack um, dead and dying trees. Um, and the other, the last thing you can kind of look for are these, we talked about it earlier, these S-shaped galleries underneath the bark. And so that's one way you can kind of identify emerald ash borer. Hemlock woolly adelgid is another important pest that we want to be aware of. It typically, when you notice it, it's going to appear like these white fluff balls that are on the twig of hemlock trees. This insect is a scale insect and you can see what it normally kind of looks like, but you almost are never gonna actually see the insect in these forms. You're mostly gonna see it in the white puffball form. This, this insect goes after Eastern and Carolina hemlock. And so you can see the hemlock cones have that kind of uh, shape. And these are, these are really important in uh, basically a lot of these trees are used as Christmas trees. So I kind of think of this insect as almost like the Grinch insect. It's, it's kind of one of those things that's going after these, these, um, these trees that are traditionally used, uh, that people like to use for Christmas trees. So in, this, is, this is another really serious threat. So in 2004, Eastern hemlock trees covered, um, you know, 
almost seven and a quarter million hectares of forest or 19, uh, 19 million acres. And now they're listed in the red list as near threatened. So this is, a, this is a, an insect that is causing some pretty severe uh, damage to our forests. And then there are, there are some, uh, of, you know, going along the lines of uh, ecological impacts and nothing really existing in a bubble. This is a black Bernian warbler. So this is a very attractive bird. And we believe that this might actually be dependent on hemlock trees. And so if we lose these trees, it's possible that this uh, black Bernian warb warbler will be in some pretty uh, hot water. So how do you find the hemlock woolly adelgid? So uh, the, again, the puffballs are going to be really obvious. Look for a hemlock tree if it has these puffballs. And the puffballs are going to be along the twigs. So that's really important. They're not going to be on the needles. If you look at this photo on the top, none of those puffballs are on the needles. It's because this insect feeds from the stem. Basically, it feeds from that. It doesn't feed from the needles. So on the bottom left, you can see some white markings on the needles. That's not hemlock woolly adelgid, that's elongate hemlock scale. That's actually another invasive insect. Um, and then you can see that the, there's also, um, you wanna look for like thinning and grayish needles. If it has yellow needles, that's, that's usually a different pest as well. The kind of nice thing about hemlock woolly adelgid is that winter is, pro, is the best time to really go out looking. Um, so the hemlock woolly adelgid is active in the winter time, and this is really, really unusual for an insect. So if you're if you're going on a on a winter walk, and you see a hemlock tree, um, check it out. You might notice these puffballs on that tree, and then it would be really important for you to uh, report that the usara hemlock woolly adelgid. Spotted lanternfly is probably one of the newer insects that I think that if you haven't heard about spotted lanternfly yet you're going to be hearing about it very soon. And I believe that this particular insect is really the next big deal. When this makes it into Massachusetts, I have no doubt in my mind that people are going to be losing their minds over this insect. So uh, if it weren't for the fact that it's invasive, again, this is a very attractive looking insect. You can see on the top left, this is an adult spotted lanternfly. You can see the wings are kind of this uh, tannish uh, brown color, but underneath it's got this brilliant red, these brilliant red hind wings. And then in its younger stages, it has these, you know, you can look at the nymphs and they can be, they're very, they're very attractive looking um, bugs. They're in there are true bugs. So this is a bug that is rapidly spreading. Um, we've expanded its quarantine each year. So if you look at Pennsylvania, where it was first introduced, yellow is 2014. And then 2015, it expanded out to orange. 2016 it was blue and then 2017 it was green and so it's been expanding very very rapidly and in uh, 2019 we had our uh, first detection uh, we're really kind of more like a we hit what we had is a one dead spotted lanternfly in Massachusetts and that was found on poinsettia um, that might have actually happened in 2018 I think it, I believe it was uh, it was winter 2018 2019 that 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 came into Massachusetts so you can see that if that wasn't dead, that that, that that spotted lanternfly might have been able to establish in Massachusetts. So we kind of almost dodged a bullet there with that particular case. So a lot of times people will say that if they saw this insect, they would very easily recognize it. Um, but the truth be told is that when you're, gonna, when you're out walking, um, this insect does blend in really well with bark when its wings are closed. And you can see like now looking up close, actually searching for it, you can see these insects. But if you were just walking through the woods, this might be something that you would miss. And the eggs, the eggs are the worst part about this insect is that they are really, really hard to see. When they're laid, they're this whitish color. You can see this, uh, this spotted lanternfly laying eggs right here. The gray patches around it are also eggs and that's what happens when they dry. They, they kind of change color. Uh, you can see that this bark here, it almost looks like mud covering the bark of this tree. And those are all dried egg masses. Almost look a little bit like gypsy moth egg masses, but, but a lighter shade. But it, depending on uh, where it lays its eggs, like this particular egg mass on this tree, you can say that that might even be impossible to, to normally see unless you're really, really hunting for that. Um, so that, that's what makes this, this particular pest so insidious is that 
the eggs are very, very difficult to see and they're laid on almost any surface. So they can be found almost anywhere. So this was underneath a bench. They found the eggs laid. This was on a, a trash can. You can see all these eggs on the bottom. You might, you see one above that little ridge, but if you look below that ridge on the bottom, you've got all of those spotted lanternflies laid on that, on that barrel. And then this is a, an egg laid on rock. So they can lay them on virtually any surface. And that's what makes, would make this so easy to spread is if you talk about like maybe the wheel wells inside a car, if you had your car parked in an area where the spotted lanternfly exists, it might lay the egg there. And then you get in your car and you drive, you know, a few states away and now you've brought those eggs into that new state. Or where I think it's gonna spread uh, very easily is along train tracks. So if you look at these plants uh, growing on the, in between these train tracks, this is tree of heaven. So this is the tree that this, we think this spotted lanternfly needs. And you've got train tracks right next to it, uh, a train stop right next to it. So if the train was carrying this, laid eggs on the train, it could just easily hop off and it's got food right there. Why is spotted lanternfly so bad? Well, uh, one of the reasons why I think people are gonna lose their minds about spotted lanternfly is that it impacts grapes, which means wine. Uh, so the wine industry is definitely under uh, threat because of the spotted lanternfly, but it also impacts apple, plum, cherry, peach, black walnut, sumac, and of course, it really, really likes the tree of heaven. If you're looking for tree, if you're looking for this spotted lanternfly, uh, it's really important that you know how to identify tree of heaven. So tree of heaven, once you once you know what it looks like, you're going to see tree of heaven everywhere because that's it's basically you look out your window and you're going to find it everywhere some people think that it's sumac some people think that it i've had someone tell me that they thought it was palm trees um but the, basically on the top left this is what it looks like from far away it's a very very tall tree it tends to grow around parks in very disturbed areas uh parking lots um, the leaves are really one of the ways that i identify it very easily if you look at these leaves they look almost like a sumac tree but if you look, they have these little nubs near the, near the base of that little leaflet. And you can see that little, it looks like a little bump, a little node, and that's what these, these leaflets have. And so that's, that, that's the leaf of Tree of Heaven. The bark almost looks like cantaloupe. It's very, very, it's gray, it's very, very smooth. And then an, one of the ways that people really, some, at least some of my friends recognize it, is by the fruits. So the fruits have this kind of funky looking appearance. I'm not sure the best way to describe it, um, but they almost look like a pea pod, almost like a yellow pea pod. Um, and so that's, these are the fruits of Tree of Heaven. So this is why people are going to lose their mind. In addition to losing wine, um, this, this insect reproduces in very, very high populations. You can see that this is a home in Pennsylvania, and this uh, spotted lanternfly is blanketing this tree. And it's right near kids. If you look at it, it's near the kids playing equipment. So this, this is just a very prolific uh, insect that just covers everything. The other thing about it is that when it feeds, it, it creates these weeping wounds in the trees. And, and also as it's feeding, and this is one of the things that a lot of the insects that are like it, or a lot of plant feeders will do, is that they'll, they'll have a way to eliminate excess waste, excess water and waste as they're feeding. And so it will excrete something called honeydew, and this will actually drip down from where they're feeding. So if you're walking through the woods, it might feel like it's raining, but that's actually the, the basically insects waste that it's excreting onto your body. And so uh, when you can imagine if you were to go into your yard and you're sitting underneath one of your shade trees and you've got the sticky wet substance just constantly dripping all over your body, all over your lawn chairs, all over uh, basically everything, that that might get old very, very quickly. And if that's not enough, that, that honeydew and these weeping wounds lead to this development of this black sooty mold at the base of these trees, which is very, very unsightly. So um, in addition to, to these things, like people complain that, you know, when they, where they have spotted lanternfly, it has even made it hard for them to enjoy their houses or uh, even made it hard for them to sell their homes. Because when people come to tour their home, they just see, they might see black sooty mold all over their yard. They might come up and they put their hand on the railing of their porch and it's got the honeydew all over the, the porch railing. And, and so that might be very difficult for, um, it might impact people's um, 
people's pockets um, in that way as well. And the fourth insect we're going to go over is the brown marmorated stink bug. So this might be a very familiar bug for most people. Uh, this is another true bug. And it looks a lot like a few other bugs we have in our area. So a lot of times I'll get a call and people will see the insect on the right. This is a western conifer seed bug. This is an insect that comes from the west coast and we might consider that invasive as well, simply because it's not supposed to be on the east coast. Um, but it's not the brown marmorated stink bug. The brown marmorated stink bug is on the left. You can, the, the big things that are gonna tip you off to this is it's got the round shoulders. And if you look at the antenna, if you look at the white markings, they happen between the antennal segments. So they'd be an antenna and like basically one segment of the antenna and then the white mar marking will basically bracket the, 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 the two segments connecting each other. And if you have any trouble with this, you can always feel free to send me a picture and I'm happy to identify it for you. The big thing with brown marmorated stink bug is, is that even though we have it here, it can be a very severe agricultural pest. It feeds directly on fruit and you can see this apple that's been damaged and this corn below that have been damaged by brown marmorated stink bug. Um, and so that can, that can result in some pretty severe losses to food, or maybe we might end up having to use a lot, of, a lot more pesticide than we normally would use to prevent that. So the big thing about brown marmorated stink bug is that it starts so, tends to start out small and then builds up very rapidly and then kind of explodes. And so these are some examples. When people call me and they say, like, I had them everywhere, um, they don't typically mean this. So you can see this person lifting up their bed mattress and that's not bed bugs, that's all stink bugs underneath their bed. Sometimes when people tell me they've had a lot, they might have had two or three, or they might find one every night. Um, these are people that are finding them all over the place all the time. And if you look at these, this is a couple that you can see the porch and they're completely covering this person's deck uh, on the posts and they're actually taking a push broom to, to push out all of these brown marmorated stink bugs into a bucket. So this is what we're watching out for when it comes to the stink bug. This is what we don't want to see happen in Massachusetts. Um, so if you do tend to see them building up into very large numbers, that's when you would want to report this. They're, we're not as interested in you reporting maybe one or two or maybe even one every night. We're interested in, in when it gets to be this bad. So we're going to do a, a quick quiz. Um, hopefully I haven't um, kept you too long, but let's just see what you can remember. Um, so I want, I'm going to, I have a poll. So I want you to guess what insect this could be. And to give you a little context, let's say that you're out walking and it's the winter time. Yep, it's, this is a hemlock woolly adelgid, and you can tell based on those puff balls. What insect do you think this could be? Yep, definitely brown marmorated stink bug. And what about this insect? So you can identify this, that you can look at this as a very uh, unique shaped leaf. Yep, spotted lanternfly. And so lastly, um, I think it should be easy to, to know this insect at this point. What do you think this could be? And this would represent blonding bark. You might not necessarily know what tree this is, um, but it has left this D-shaped hole. This insect would be emerald ash borer. And so at this point, uh, I'd like to take any questions. I also had a, a, a link at the bottom. I, I sometimes get questions about spotted wing drosophila. 
So if people are interested in that, I've got this link at the bottom on this slide. Um, but I'm happy to start entertaining any questions that people might have now. <laughs> 